very, very interested in how we get Ladies and gentlemen, housing I companies call you to wake up. Mm, yes, well, there you go. For you. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Mark Cummings. I'm the director and founder of Invicta Public Affairs. I'm delighted to be sponsoring tonight's event. I've uh, been in the market now for about a year, working in Wales, working in renewables in particular, with a number of our clients, um, some of whom are here tonight. And been working with David and his team at Renewable UK Cymru for the last you know, number of months, and also with Marie and her team for the last number of years uh, in London and their colleagues at Scottish Renewables. I think it's fair to say with the election result returning a Conservative majority government, of which I'll offer no comment whether that was a good or a bad thing, it does change the dynamic of how business is done in the United Kingdom. No more do we have a situation whereby one party can have a concurrent policy position across different jurisdictions in the UK. We already have with devolution differential responsibilities with market responsibilities sitting in the UK government and planning responsibility largely sitting in the devolved uh, you know, nations of the United Kingdom. And, and indeed in Wales at the moment, Alan, who's with us tonight, the chair of the Environment Sustainability Committee, will no doubt give you a few words later about the new planning bill that has just been approved by the Welsh Assembly. Can I start us also by saying that we're delighted tonight to have Jenny Rathbone here. She is actually the member for Cardiff Central, so we're sitting in her constituency, I believe, and um, we're delighted to have her as a host. And she'll start tonight's proceedings by saying a few words about the renewable sector, the importance to Wales, and probably a few words as well about her own party's position, the Labour Party's position, and how they move that agenda forward. So, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much and welcome to Cardiff Central. Um, the, uh, we haven't just been uh, implementing the Planning Act, uh, which was uh, literally yesterday. Um, it received approval. Um, but uh, the Future Generations Act um, provides the framework for the Planning Act and the Environment Bill, which is um, next off the... Um, off the blocks um, is part of that suite of, of legislation which demonstrates that uh, the Welsh Government is serious about meeting our obligations on climate change and the population of Wales will keep us to those commitments because there was a, 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 a an extensive consultation with the public um, called the Wales we want which uh, made it absolutely clear that the Wales we want is one is a, is a Wales that is sustainable and um, keeps within our environmental limits um, in relation to the other nations of the world. So regardless of uh, my disappointment at the outcome of the general election, um, nevertheless, the UK government is obliged to deliver on the climate change targets that it's signed up to in international conventions. So that that is regardless of what colour the government is in London and uh, it is the same for the Welsh government. We, we have to meet our climate change obligations if we are going to um, allow the next generation to inherit the world that they would want to live in. Um, so the, the challenges ahead for all public bodies and anybody who's thinking of um, pitching for public contracts is that we have to be thinking sustainably in everything we do, and that's everything from the way we um, deliver our energy to the, the way we build our houses, to the way we uh, get to work, um, either on foot or cycling, or by some other means. Um, and I think that um, it is disappointing to read that the Department for in environment and climate change in London seems to think that um, if we don't start digging up um, the, um, the surface of uh, Wales and um, digging for shale gas that we'll simply run out of energy. I absolutely don't buy that. I think there's a huge possibilities for us here in Wales, both from solar energy and wind, en wind energy, which complement each other, and also from the huge tidal energy um, resources that we have all around our coast. So it gives me um, great uh, pleasure to um, introduce Simon Roberts, 
who is um, going to um, revive the uh, Phil Williams Memorial Lecture, which uh, my colleague um, Alan Fred uh, will speak about Phil later, as he actually knew him, so I'll leave that to him. Um, but I, I was interested to read in this book that Arup um, and others have, have produced is, is um, a chapter by Simon where can we afford a low carbon economy? My, re my response would be we cannot not afford a low carbon economy. And so I'm very interested to hear what Simon has to say. Simon. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for Renewables Wales for allowing me the opportunity to talk on this subject. Here are a few notes about the series, and I was looking at one of the past speakers, Kevin Anderson, and he had rather a terrific title there, Drinking in the Last Chance Saloon. And I was inspired by that too, for the title that you saw a bit earlier. Uh, now this is in 2007. And the title there, The Last Chance Saloon, and yet we're eight years on. In climate change, the issues are still even more profound. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. The Two Titans. This is where I think there's a, a great polarization between the advocates and the advertis 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 advertisers, as it were. Come on, let's move. This is one way to put it. Would you associate yourselves with one side or the other? Do you think you could kind of relate to the passion of the little girl hugging the earth? Uh, perhaps none of you would sign up to be just after the dollar. Here's another way of looking at this polarization, where over the 20th century, the, you could say there's been a bit of a bandwagon, and that's how those of the free market and so on might, might refer to. So we've got the nuclear disarmament, the environment, sustainability, climate change, is it? The same group haven't changed their spots, they've just picked up another <laughs> umbrella to, to be motivated by. And then does one just give it up, go into the hills, and as long as you've got your own PV and your own wind turbine, you've really disconnected and you've, you're being responsible to the earth, and on the other side, you're stuck in the office. Can you relate to those two sides? I perhaps won't ask which one you'd want to do. But getting a bit more... Oh, here we go. Right. So that, that was some, some imagery to give you a bit of a feel for it. But now going to some more serious things. This is a physics department in Sydney was looking at a zero carbon Australia. That's the ZCA. And they did a great piece of work to look at what's possible there, solar, wind, all that sort of thing. And they came up with a figure for the cost. And on the right-hand side, that's the bar in the middle, which they then related to the cost of other things. And they come up with, and it's the same as alcohol gambling and recreation. Now, what are they trying to do with that? Is that to say, look, it's cheap, or you shouldn't be doing those things? Perhaps you recognize uh, this author. Professor Mackay, in his book, Sustainability Without Hot Air, lots of good analysis of the supply and demand. And then you get to the financial part. Again, adding up how much it costs. And this time, he chose to compare it to perfumes and makeup. Maybe you can imagine a man would try and show uh, the frivolousness of these other expenditures. So this is 2009. And by making that comparison, has it moved the agenda on at all? And I'm, I'm suggesting this is rather naive and we can do better and need to do better. Moving to the other side, to the economists. And uh, you, you've seen this way of putting across economics, which you can't violate with the market. Supply and demand, it all kind of meets in the middle. But the way this is applied to looking at macroeconomics, so it's something called CGE, computational general equilibrium, used by the World Bank and so on, actually, the models aren't that great. They can only look very close to where the crossover points are. They're not able 
to do the big changes is what with, with what we're needing. And this is a, a major limitation of the tools that they have that they don't really come clean with. We had a recent event. And um, let me pick out some of the points from this. One click on. Great. So out of those pledges, whether you think they're fair or not from the, the government who's put them in, something that all parties said is the people have spoken. Maybe not you in here, but the majority. And I think it's very important to see what, what people are saying about the, the various issues. Now, looking at those pledges, what I find very striking at the top is these three all to do with jobs. Not really surprising, but this is something I, you want you to remember for, for later on as we get on to it in the talk. And here's another one. I hope you regard that as a good one. And then, oh dear. And there's, there's a kind of climate change fatigue here. Did climate change even feature in the election? Not really. And it's rather sad, even though we had the introductory words that says it's even more important. So now I'm going to talk about how to fill this space because I think there's a desperate problem with the polarization of views and the tools and all that sort of thing. And I have to acknowledge, not, I mean, I'm very pleased to acknowledge work I've been doing with colleagues uh, in Arab and outside of Arab. You can see the workshops there. So another physicist uh, at Brunel University and then uh, somebody in the Department of International Development and also an economist at NEF, which is the New Economic Foundation. So what I'm going to be talking about it has benefited from the great stimulating discussions we've had, and we're going to bring it together in a piece for COP21, that's the climate change negotiations that will be in Paris later this year. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about to, to set the scene to how we fill this space is language and data, and in a sense, this is what physicists do, define terms and get some data together. And the great data here is to do with GDP. Uh, I just need to say something to the back desk. Is this the latest PowerPoint that I gave you earlier? Because I have a feeling you might have done the old one. Are you sure you got this one? Anyway, if you could just look at the time of this one. Otherwise, I'll be surprised by what comes along. Okay. <laughs> oh, I think that was 11 o'clock this morning instead of 3 o'clock this afternoon. Anyway, on this data, GDP, you've all heard of GDP. Now, GDP can be represented in, in two ways. One is looking at what industries, industries produce. That's the P part. Okay. And uh, on... on here I've listed the major industries. As you can see, they start from agriculture and going down. And then there's another way of looking at GDP, which is what we consume at the end. Now, the thing about GDP, GDP is a, a great resource of data, and everyone's heard of GDP, and it's a broad brush uh, that covers a load of things, but I'm suggesting that we throw this brush away and that we look at some components which I've shown in the pie chart. Because when you look behind GDP to where it comes from, the first major part you see is manufacturing. So that's the grey brush. And then another important part is construction. And then a really big part, which is the services. Okay, And another part. You didn't realise there's something called rental in there. And actually, rental includes what owner-occupiers would have paid if you were paying rent in order to make GDP comparable between countries. Just cut that out. It's not very helpful. So we get rid of that one, and we're left with these major three. And that's the first thing to get across, is don't just go by the big GDP. It's just not a very helpful metric. But you only have to come down one layer to see these three underneath. And I'm going to pursue it through as to what they're going to tell us. This was the Global Calculator launched in, in January. 
Uh, I don't know if you're following this, this calculator, which comes from DEC. I went to the Royal Society to see the launch, and I was thinking, yeah, okay, where, where are my brushes there? If we, if we go in close to there, we've got manufacturing. Where's services? Because you saw from my pie chart, it was a big chunk. Actually, it's under buildings. Now, there's something major issue the way that people connect with this activity within the economy. You'll rarely see services put there, and I'll be talking about this quite a bit. So let me give it a little bit more flesh. So I've taken that big part of the pie chart, that part of industries, and then this is what it's made up of. It's not just finance, it's not just IT, it's a whole heap of things, and I'd imagine pretty much most of you here can associate yourself with these parts, and you are under something called the service industry. Now, um, I've introduced industries. It's a great way to look at how production is divided up. And then you've got the end use part. And something happens in between. Because when you're buying things from the shops, you're not buying them from the factories. They go through various stages. So something goes on between them. And it's shown by this Sankey diagram, which is in the little booklets that you can pick out. I'm not going to talk about that, but just to say that we can also look at GDP by the end use. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the categories there. And a clear part of the end use are goods, services, rental. But there's another part, and that's called investment. You should see it's quite major. And you also see on the diagram the little arrows. It's a very useful part of the numbers that are underneath this gathering of this deriving of GDP to show that part of the economy which is building everything else. The technical term is GFCF. It's at the bottom. Gross fixed capital formation. Now, to build everything in the industries, this building here, the PV, the wind, cars, everything, that's where it comes from. And this is a terrific source of data and how we should be thinking, how we deliver on the things that we need, as I'm going to show you further on. And in a way, it comes on the plate as a methodology that's within in the metrics there. But I'll leave that on one side and move on to the goods and services. Okay? So this is what you and I buy and what's provided to us by, by the government, government services. So here, we're looking at those two parts of consumption, the economist term. We're looking at historical data from 1990 up to 2012. So we consume more services and goods. Now, an intriguing thing here is that goods have been rising and then they're flat. You think, wait a minute. I'm told all the time that we're consuming more and more and more. And this is this sloppiness with the, with the, with the terminology and with the data. So the goods part is actually flat for about the last 10 years. But what has been rising is services, and that's been going up and up and up. And so we've got to be very careful when we hear this mantra of uh, consuming society, because correct, that is technically called consumption, but then it goes straight in presuming it's all about the physical things you can see and not the services. And I, s I hear it all the time, and sort of not seeing what the data is really telling us. Okay, now I'm going back to the industries, because that view of it is quite helpful to see what goes in. And I've got my three brushes, because they're the major parts of the economy. The other ones, you don't need to worry about. That's why I've grayed them out. So we've got manufacturing, construction, and services. And now I'm going to look at what goes into them. And the thing about this view is to take good data... In the case of jobs, it's jobs. When I get on to other things, I'll be talking about energy units and so on. And this is a difference from the economists, because the economists will just stick with their money, their price, whereas we need to look at the, the physical scale, and that's what I'm going to be showing you about, and that's why I've changed colour to, to the purple there. So jobs. Here we go. And this is a division of jobs between all the industries. And look at the winner, services. It's a major employer. It's a big deal. And that's why I find it very strange, then, with the global calculator that's not even shown there. It's called buildings. And you can see here that there's lots of jobs in construction, the purple, lots of jobs in, in manufacturing. Uh, 
it's all rising, but clearly the, the services is taken over. It's a major employer. That's a plain fact. And of course, the other crucial thing about jobs, the opposite side is unemployment. The unemployment has gone up and down over the last, uh, since, since 1990. And that, that's a real killer in a way. Uh, everybody can relate to the fact whether they've got a job or not. It affects the family, it affects the community, it affects the district, it affects the country, it affects the exchequer. Unemployment is a real killer, which I'll re return to a bit later. What are other inputs? Other inputs, of course, are energy. And the important thing here is to look at all of them in energy units, whether those are joules or kilowatt hours. And so you've got all the raw fuels on the left, and then they get processed. So just to show how we can look at that, it's a, it's a bit easier to put them all in terms of CO2. Otherwise, it's difficult to add electricity and uh, raw fuels together. So here's a way, here's a way to, uh, here, here's the CO2 then, historically. And this is in terms then of the inputs. So the inputs serving all the industries and housing and transport now are electricity, heating, and transport fuels. And you can see recently that the curve has been coming down. So that was triggered by, uh, to some extent, by the, the recession. But actually, it's been going on, and the trend has been coming downwards. And you can see mostly that that's the heating part, the dark color. And then, of course, one could look, instead, slice it a different way, the same envelope. But now we're going to associate it all by by, um, by, by the industry's users. So here, the top part is the smaller industries, agriculture and so on, don't actually have much uh, impact by the CO2 emitted by the fuels that they use. But the main ones here are clearly uh, manufacturing, not much on the construction itself. That's mostly labor. Service is quite big. Housing is very big. And then there's passenger transport and then uh, freight at the bottom. model. I'm a physicist, I like models. I think physicist Phil would have liked to model. Uh, I work at Arup, we do lots of models. So it's time for a model. And the model I'm talking about in a small print is one that's been developed at Arup that's called 7C. How to set about doing this model? And the purpose of the model is to evaluate it from a physical point of view. Although the metrics come from GDP, the terminology there, there is a volume of flows of, of various things. So I've, I've created this language here in this terminology, which I hope you're with. And now to say how to set about doing the model. And the first thing in, in this model is to make it demand-led, because I think the, the, the markets, the societies, the economies we live in, the market is king in a way. So the first point from the model's point of view as to how to set it up is to say it's, it's demand-led. But all these other things have to feed it. And that's not just the industries responding to final demand, but also the energy and jobs feeding those and the raw fuels and so on. And then the crucial thing is, how do you make it stack up? It's the part at the top, the GFCF. So within the economy, to meet that final demand, you need another office block or factory. That has to be built. And that's that part at the top. Anyway, let's go through um, showing how the model works, first of all, to reproduce the historical data, which is why I keep showing the historical data there. So as I said, to do in the historical part, it starts with uh, demand, and the demand you've seen already, which is that demand for goods and services, which historically has been for the economy. And what the model does is to finish off working out the other things. And what the model does, it works out the amount of unemployment from, from that period. Because the model starts with initial conditions and it runs forward. And the model has generated the curve on the right. So now, to compare that curve on the right to what the actual data is. Which is quite a good fit. You, now this is a challenge. No one else does this. Economists don't do this. This is quite a big deal. I mean, there's way more behind the model than a few slides, but you're very right to say, how good is the model? How can you test it? Physicists often work in, in uh, contexts where 
they can test the models, but more so the type of work physicists do are put to applied in, in, in the sense in the real world, and likewise in engineers, engineering models, they're for making buildings stand up, and they have to stand up. So it's very important then to make sure that any model that is being put forward has got some substance, and there's one way to try and get across to you that it's not bad. BAU, business as usual. Now, having got a model that appears to reproduce unemployment pretty well, how do you use the model now to go forwards? Because ultimately, what I'm trying to show you is a way to physically evaluate whether low carbon policies are okay for the economy and meet the various needs of the majority. So the first thing is to do a business as usual. How's that done? Right. We have to set the terrain out here. I'm going to do an assumption in doing this business as usual for the future. I'm going to, it's the exogenous part. What do I dictate to the model first? And the first one is to extrapolate that demand for goods. Because if it's been constant for 10 years, it seems very plausible to be constant going on. If we were consuming even more goods, our houses would fill up. <laughs> so that's the first part that goes into, another, into the model. Something else to go into the model is uh, one of the generations. So on this curve here, this graph on the right, it's shown the power generation, and that one there is a coal generation, and the coal generation is on the gender set by the EU, the large plant directive. They're basically being closed, and so that's put into the model as part of the business as usual. Now, the next thing to drive the model is unemployment, not growth. Because I feel that what should drive the, the model is something that we all feel. We all feel unemployment. And I think that was shown by my selection of those pledges. Three pledges to do with jobs. So the way the model is configured to run into the future is to meet an unemployment objective. And I picked a figure of 6%, which is sometimes appears in uh, the Federal Reserve and the States and also the Bank of England has talked about this number. Basically, above 6%, Governments try really hard to get it down. When it's below 6%, then the priorities move elsewhere. How are we going to meet it? Services. So I don't know if, you, if you're following me here. The model is seeking to get 6%, and the services grow to soak up the unemployed and give them jobs. Not many people think about the economy in this way. A few do. But my looking at how things are following, this is how the model is run, and this is one way to think what the future is about. So you then look, so what growth came from doing that? So we're following through here within the model. The model is set to achieve 6% unemployment. We look at what the consequent demand for services are to meet that. And oh, what growth do we get? As it turns out, the model says it's about 1%. Anyway, that's, that's set in the business as usual, so that, hey, let's look at what the emissions are going to be. Because behind this are lots of little trends that I can't talk about, but there's lots of data within it all, but I'm showing you then what results. And so here, with uh, the emissions, on the left is the fuels, and the top colour is coal, and you can see that that's tapering away. To some extent, it's been taken up by gas, which is the next colour down, and then the bottom colour is the petroleum products, which is the transport fuels. This is showing emissions by fuels, and of course it's not showing on here what's being displaced by renewables. That's just one way of looking at it. But what this business is showing, that despite maintaining 6% unemployment, it appears if we don't do very much, business as usual, current governments, one might say, our CO2 emissions at least aren't rising to 2035. And on the right-hand side, this looks at it the other way, another way around, which is by the users. So the grey at the top, the same grey from the colours here. This is from manufacturing. And then the next one down is from services, and below that is housing. Next one down is personal transport. And then the grey at the bottom is freight transport. So you can see the one that's pushing up while some are getting narrower is the personal transport, aviation. You know all about that story. Right. Policies for low carbon. How does one do it into a model? This is a crucial thing. Where is it better 
the economists with their limited to fi only 5% changes. This is a crucial bit, really. The way to put it into the model is to ask for any policy three questions. A, can it be scaled up? And this is where I look to other people's work, which I'll go through and I'll list it, not their names, but to find out who's looked into PV and solar and all these sorts of things, how quickly can they be scaled up? And I need to look at those that really can be scaled. The next one, how much do they cost? And I'll explain how that then feeds into the model and makes the model realistic with the same where things come from. And then finally, what's the benefit we get? To what extent do they generate renewable energy and offset CO2, or to what extent do they save energy? So here's the first list. You'll recognize these, a whole load of um, types of renewable for generation. And the various percentages is just a shorthand for the way I've looked into 2050 pathways, the work of the AA technology, Ricardo, all these various people. Um, just looking on the right-hand side, where I've shown you this chart of the generators, where the top one is a coal generation coming down and down and down. And now you can see some of the renewables. So the onshore wind is the top one that flattens out rather soon. Offshore wind rising a bit faster, PV. So that's giving you a bit of a fl flavor of uh, these policies, clearly, that will um, contribute the renewable generation. And this now is the efficiency measures. You can just cast your eye down. So it's the organs, organ Well, I'm pulling out every stop, but certainly looking to see who, what, to what degree they're, they're plausible and how quickly. So for instance, at the bottom of the transport ones that come from work by Ricardo, if we take the transport ones, for instance, it says it's perfectly possible to do a van or a car that's more efficient. It's going to cost more, though. And that's the price tag. So that takes me on to the B part of this ABC, which is where it comes from. Now, I've introduced this bit at the top, the investment, the GFCF, Gross Fixed Capital Formation. That shopping list of all those generators and ways of increasing efficiency, they have to come from somewhere. Now, The Economist says the interest rate, you know, if the carbon price is right, it just kind of appears. That's not good enough. The great thing about what I try to introduce here is that you can trace from the construction of the additional needed for passive house or the retrofit to housing or the extra you need on the truck and so on, you can take it back and route it all the way through the economy. And that's what I've shown here. Now, because you can't make something for nothing, if we're doing more for number three, all this extra stuff, where does it come from? And so I'm suggesting you have to reduce the goods and services that go to people. So let's look at some of the numbers in all these policies where the organ stops are all pulled out. So that's that top part. This graph I haven't shown you yet, but you can see on the left is this gross fixed capital formation, GFCF. Hope you're learning this. And you can see historically as the data to how much has gone to all these things, as it were, replacing factories and so on. And you can also see where the model has reproduced it pretty well, I think. Now, going forward is the business as usual, the lower one. Where we're wanting to have this sustainable future, with all those policies, we have to, in quotes, spend more, but it means we have to divert from the economy. What might have gone to a washing machine now goes to a wind turbine. It's that kind of thing. And that shopping list raises it by that amount, which you think, good, it's not too big, but it's quite high. You've got to reduce from elsewhere, though. So I've shown you these already. This is yuan our consumption of goods and services. They have to go down a little bit. It's not very much, though, is it? So I don't talk about perfumes and makeup is to say there is a kind of, uh, we have to have a diversion with the economy. But remember, unemployment hasn't gone up. This is about diverting it. And one way you could look at it, this slight reduction on the trend of services going up, it simply delayed the even more services that we might have got in a few years' time. You can imagine where we might have been here with the green curve, we're a little bit later. What are we going to do with all these services? I don't know. <laughs> we'll find a way to create more services that we buy and that 
keeps the whole engine chugging around. What do the policies do? See, terrific. It's really come down. This stacks up physically with all those policies, and the economy can do it all, and it's achieving the low unemployment with those first three pledges. And now to see how this was accomplished, so we can fill in what's been avoided. So on the left, the left is saying what now isn't burnt. So the top there is uh, less gas being burnt, and the lower part of the purple is less petroleum products, that's the transport fuels. Alternatively, we can see which parts of the economy, so it goes through the industries and then the others. So these are the colored slices on the right. So you can see manufacturing, it's basically the spaces they occupy, space heating and lighting, really. Then the services, the sort of building, and then it goes down to housing, it's quite a big one. A lot can be gained there, then it goes down to passenger transport and then down to freight transport. The thing is, this now stacks up as being a kind of physical evaluation to be plausible. Once one's got this, then you have to turn it into policy. And that's when the economist should take something that's workable and then figure out the best way for the details of um, pricing and so on to move in this sort of direction. And the last part is to get the politicians to sell it off. So, the bedfellows of my title. First of all, to go through what I've been introducing to you, quite a few things. The first one is use good data. And instead of, not the broad brush, which I've thrown away, but to come down to those three, not the rental part, which you don't realize that you're, you're, you're including, but the main thing is to think of the language of manufacturing, consumption, and services. There's so many benefits that follow from that in terms of their contribution to the economy or the way they have jobs and the energy and the trends in energy use, all that sort of thing. The next thing I want to make, try to show you just from the data, is our consumption of goods has leveled out. So don't keep going on about consumption in society. You can be a bit more sophisticated, I'll suggest. And then, rather than growth, which is the way that the sort of left side parody the right, you can, in a very neutral way, think that the economy is to give us jobs self-esteem, all that sort of thing, income and so on. And I think that's reflected in looking at those pledges, three pledges in the current government. And then, don't ignore the service industry. Um, I put here in italics, unlimited demand. It seems to be very elastic, the degree to which we just pay each other to do things for each other. But that's how the economy is working. And if we have that vision, I suppose, of the sustainable economy into the future, it's okay. And it is consistent, we're going low carbon and all the other things, I suppose. So, the next thing as I've shown you is to look at a whole spread of policies. I just listed a number up there that I've come across, but the idea of this approach is to make it inter interactive, to work with people. It's a tool. It's a neutral one by which, you, by which anyone can then put different policies in and see what effect they're having. Um, and then it's not, it's not about subsidies. A subsidy is kind of a smokescreen to say it still costs a lot. If PV were to stay expensive and it was masked by an, a subsidy, it's still taken a lot from the economy. And I think that's where the, the feed-in tariffs have come a cropper in Spain, Germany, and Australia. Because when it gets big, someone goes, that's way too much money. But what they're meaning is way too much diversion of the economy. So the language we should be thinking about is to what extent the economy is creating all the stuff that we need in addition, all the uh, energy efficiency measures. So the language there is GFCF. Run a physical evaluation. Here's one I've just shown you. And I think it is possible. So I want to end with a positive note. I think that's terribly important. That what I've shown you is a realistic proposition for the economy. Lead. But it's got to be it's got to be connected with, and I think it's terribly important that leaders engage with what it's about, embrace the concepts, and then pitch it. Because it could easily be uh, dismissed by yes, you're 
reduction in standard of living by reduced consumption of goods and services. I'm so, so small. What does that mean, reduction in standard of living? I don't think standard of living is actually in the pledges by the, by the government. Okay, I said I was going to have some dating advice. <laughs> That's a good start. Use a common language. You're going to get a rapport by the two parties speaking to each other. Now, interesting one here, Dates not audition for a marriage, because the couple might be quite tense with that. And I think that also compares to these parties. You're not kind of giving in to the other side. And the last one is be positive. Not always moaning. And I think that way, the best of both can go forward. And we, we so much need to um, deliver on this sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for that uh, uplifting uh, presentation. It's a great privilege um, to be here uh, saying a few words in this uh, revived Dr. Phil Williams um, lecture. Um, Phil was a physicist, of course. He was many things. He was a, a sort of a politician for a while. Um, he was a polymath and an early promoter of green energy and uh, energy conservation, of course, um, and is... Uh, premature death was a great loss uh, to Wales. Um, you heard that I'm, I chair the uh, Environment and Sustainability Committee down in the, uh, in the Assembly, and we've been dealing, as Jenny said, with a number of bills which are relevant to the uh, discussion here tonight, the Future Generations Bill, the Planning Bill, which has just uh, passed, and the, we are now faced with an environment, environmental bill which, environments bill, which, um, which we will be uh, getting to grips with in the coming, coming months. And uh, we hope that they all gel together, though we haven't quite worked out whether they do, in fact, uh, as yet. Um, in terms um, of, uh, anyway, obviously we, we scrutinize the government and in terms of climate change and all the rest of it, uh, but it just feels to me that the time for talking certainly here in Wales has come to an end or is coming to an end and that we need to see uh, action uh, uh, following uh, the good words and the good uh, intentions of these bills that uh, we have passed. Uh, recently, the, uh, the committee, our committee went to Germany. Uh, we are embarking on an inquiry uh, um, which uh, has to do with the... Um, energy vendor system that has been uh, adopted by the German government and we went to uh, Baden-Württemberg um, and I must admit I was struck, uh, we went to Freiburg which is perhaps um, uh, an unfair comparison but uh, I was struck uh, by a couple of things there. Firstly, that there is a, seems to be a general acceptance from the, even from the right to the left politically that uh, we have to do something and that they're actually already engaged in uh, facing climate change in a realistic but in a very practical way. And Freiburg itself, of course, is, uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of what can be achieved in terms of um, building, c construction, transport. Um, it really does, uh, does leave me breathless, really, compared to where we are in Wales and in general in the, in, 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 in the UK. Um, and the other thing that struck me was that um, Stuttgart and the area around it is a manufacturing um, a powerhouse, isn't it? And yet they are facing up to uh, phasing out nuclear energy seemingly um, uh, with, with a great deal of uh, confidence that uh, this will not... Um, upset the apple cart. Now then, I'm not saying, I'm not denying that there aren't any tensions there, there certainly are, but certainly politically, there seems to be agreement that we, they have to do something and that they will do something. And uh, though I'm in danger of straying to uh, generalities here, you seem to have the feeling that the Germans will uh, actually accomplish what they intend, uh, what they, intend uh, what they say that they intend to do as well. 
Anyway, uh, enough of my witterings. Um, this was a wonderfully uh, uh, challenging uh, speech tonight and uh, presentation. So I think, uh, Simon, that you are going to field some questions. I'm certainly not going to field them on your behalf. Um, so um, the floor is open, and uh, all I'll do is I'll point to people and say yes. And then Simon will answer the question, obviously. Right, um, I will start uh, with you, sir. At the, uh, perhaps you might say your name and if you... Uh, Neil Anderson, Pace Transportation. My field is transportation, obviously, but I think there are analogues with energy here as well, that we have an issue about delivery in Wales and in the UK about an alternative to business as usual. And it seems to me that we lack the, the governance structures for both the advancement of, or at least progress, to sustainable transportation and to sustainable energy. Uh, Alan and Fred mentioned the... Uh, a cohesion and agreement from left to right in Germany. Uh, I'm not sure we have that yet. We have that yet here. I think we're still fumbling around in the dark, so to speak, at, at the moment. But what I want to ask you is how you would consider about what would be an appropriate structure for us to deliver the future that we obviously all want.
was fundamentally flawed uh, in at least two areas. Um, I think you completely failed to understand the relationship between the service sector and the manufacturing sector. They're not independent of each other at all. For example, the service sector actually transports, finances, markets and advertises manufactured goods. They're very closely related. Secondly, what is in the service sector today was actually in the manufacturing sector 20 years ago. Big companies had their own canteens, etc. So what you've had actually is a huge outsourcing of manufacturing to the service sector. They're not independent at all. They actually grow very, very, very closely together. So I mean, although they now and again might go in opposite directions, but that's because the data, as I say, that you've got there is so out of date because you know it is looking at a very narrow area. And in fact, if you look at manufacturing, when we look at how much we spend in this country, we spend a heck of a lot more than 10% of our incomes on manufactured goods. That's the lie between not understanding the relationship between the service sector and the manufacturing sector. So I think on that score, you know, it's completely bunkum. Secondly, you started off your lecture with, with an inconsistency. You said there are two ways of measuring GDP. There's actually three ways of measuring GDP. You mentioned production and, and expenditure. But there's a very important third way, and that's in terms of incomes. And because you ignored the incomes, you failed to mention a very important part of incomes, which is profit. Now, when you came to gross capital fixed formation, gross fixed capital formation, you completely misunderstand that you don't just get capital formation. Capital formation is about the future. And because it's about the future, you have to look at future expectations of interest rates, future expectations of various things, and profits very much comes into that. And therefore, you can't just turn it on and off. It's very much driven by what people expect from the future and the return they expect from it. So I think wonderfully you know, interesting stuff, but I think, unfortunately, fundamentally flawed. That was the second lecture that you... <laughs> <laughs> now, what is right there is called input-outputs, and also called supply and table information. So anything within the model is rather boring. I wasn't going to dwell on it. It's shown in this picture here. And the thing is, absolutely, there's the outsourcing, the whole dependency between them that's captured on this page as the Sankey diagram. And you're absolutely right, they've been changing over time. Now, the transition or the outsourcing can be captured. It's the same data as economists use, exactly. So it's quite fair to criticize, because I didn't talk about that, because it's a bit technical and a bit boring, to be honest. But it's a fundamental part of how one works with the data and I'll happily talk to you about them. It's documented in, in peer-reviewed papers as well. Now, this is where, you're absolutely right, there are three forms of uh, GDP. There's expenditure, output, and income. What's interesting about the whole methodology by which GDP is calculated is the quality of data. And the key point that national accountants talk about is volume flows. And it starts by looking at the output where you take goods and you quantify their volume. And this is important because from year to year, you want to take out the effects of inflation and talk about the real increase in GDP. So if we accept that the national accountants have quantified the volume of goods, and this is their language, it's taken that quantification back upstream to the quantification that comes from the factory. Now, this is a very subtle point because from a physicist, I'm taking this quantification of the stuff. It's quantification of services. And that quantification of it is the same as quantifying energy and quantifying water. I see no difference because it starts from the quantification of goods and goes back. Now, economists go in a different direction and they say it just goes back to money. Now, this is also quite a subtle point, but the data is so rich there in trying to look back at things and starting from this quantification of the expenditure, which is how the inflation is derived and thus used to go back through. So from my point of view, the physicists, there is a great mine of information within national accounts, which I've brought out by the three brushes, and then looking at the relationships between things. And I've worked in industry for 15 years, so in a sense I can, I can recognize the relationships between what you do in a factory to produce certain stuff. And it's not just about price. If the market will buy what you have, you've got the relationship between people working in the factory and the utility that your products produce. So from a macro scale, 
you have these blocks of society called services and manufacturing that are given rise to the final forms. And through that, you can map through to the resources need to deliver factories. Now, it's not, no different from those analyses that take certain articles and map it through to CO2. You've heard about the carbon footprint. You've heard about the water footprint. All they're doing is starting from that final form, going through the intermediate consumption described in here, which I didn't talk about, to the industries to say how much did they use. And so that the carbon footprint of a, a consumption and uh, the water footprint is the same principle that's being applied here. And in a way, this model takes it a stage further to try and do a bit more and find uh, what is physically feasible for an economy. But this is a debate we should surely continue. Thank you. Indeed, but not now. <laughs> how much time have we got? Are we, a couple of questions? Okay. Uh, Our music. Yeah, uh, uh, David Club from Renewable UK. My question is a lot more straightforward. Um, one of the assumptions which underpins your model of low carbon electricity in the future, which is one of the, the, the new policies, if you like, that we, we're gonna need, used figures which you took from 2050 type projections. And I have to say that my gut feeling from looking at the numbers is that they're probably a bit out of date. So for example, I think the figure for uh, PV was an increase in 50 or 75%, increase in onshore wind by 50%. Those feel dated to me, particularly given the reduction in costs on the, on the PV sector. So are you fully confident that those reflect the trend of costs within industry, or, or can we go further and faster than, than what your current model suggests? No, I'm not confident. <laughs> uh, I was trying to find what the government felt the future projection for the wind and PV are, and they say, can't tell you now. That's because it would go against the commercial nature of the, uh, what's it called now, the, um, What's the new pricing system for the suppliers of... Uh, yeah, that's right, contractor difference. And because of all that business now, they, I used to have the figures. It's very handy to say this is what the government thinks about projections. Now they won't publish it. They do a gross renewables. But this was really a uh, dip in the tone as an illustration. The main point about it is there are assumptions of what is plausible to scale by. There's a price, things like the learning curve, the way costs will come down, and that's as equally important to put in there. And I was more trying to say it is possible to put all this together in a context of a society that's evolving in a way that manufacturing is outsourcing the, ser outsourcing the service in. Put the whole lot in, it is possible. And within that, to test. So my last point was more of an invitation. To say I'd love to work with people who would like to test different possibilities, different policies. What if? these forms of energy were to become much cheaper and it were really possible to, to uh, solid wall insulation. Ah, when is that gonna come about? You know, the poor housing stock in Wales desperately is improving. If, if a, a demonstration project could show that the rate of uh, implementation could be accelerated, then put it in and see what impact it would have to then see how much less gas we might need in the future and then impact on balance of payments and so on. Right, uh, one other question, anybody? Anybody up for it? Yes, there's one at the back there, to the left. Uh, you talked about, uh, talk about low carbon policies, and you showed a graph that showed a, a big drop in the use of coal, which is understandable. Does your model take into account the, the risk of uh, carbon capture and storage becoming more prevalent? There's a lot of potential investment going into that market at the moment.
we will forego even more on our goods and services for additional investment needed to advance actual city safety for lots of Chinese things, like Indian things, and thank you, Jane. And it's a uh, heavy chunk of tax and compensation projects in the country. We know how to do it. They do it from time to time, the whole time, the whole time. So the chemical companies are processors geared to moving the tongue around. But it's, it's not, have we got the, the additional benefit? or either the generating companies only when perhaps it's put back in the ground to get more oil out, which always seems so ironic. It's sequestering carbon to get, to get more oil. Now that works and it sells and that, that happens in places and we don't have to do it. Nevertheless, if we really say we're going to do carbon capture and sequestration, of course it can be put in. And the point about this doing this modeling is it's got the time, I mean not got the time, it puts the time factor in. So if you say we have a fleet of nuclear power stations, you know it's going to take a long time. But even if you wanted to go for that, you can put it in the Gen Deer, explain how to cope for quite a long period, whereas we can do it from the turbines and things much very quicker. So one could put carbon capture and sequestration on shore and see what the consequences of the tongue would be, just to drive on the steel price and so on, consequences of reduced efficiency, and make a decision. But you have to remember there's another wish list. Has to be three. This low carbon policy is only one set of uh, you know, lobby, as it were. There's also you know, improvements of schools and so on. And this is really the major challenge for international nuclear deal to get. There's lots of other things that we might be able to do as well. But likewise, we've got a mix of all the other things such as the economy that we need you with transportation and so on, that may not be as good as these two. So it's trying to get real with the whole spread. And for instance, looking at all these pledges. Societies want an overall that's suffering climate change fatigue. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Simon. And um, it's uh, been uh, uh, a positive and uh, enlightening uh, evening, uh, even if it was bunkum, uh, according to <laughs> some people. Uh, um, anyway, it's been, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the uh, presentation. And I'm very pleased that uh, this lecture has been revived, and I hope that it will. Uh, become a, an annual event uh, to the going to the future. So once again, will you, will you show your appreciation uh, to Simon for his presentation? Thank you.